All right, welcome to sensation and perception. Uh, you'll find that sensation and perception is tied in directly to brain and behavior. And it is a little bit complex because we're going to talk about uh, stuff like the electromagnetic spectrum and the eye, different parts of the eye, uh, all of these things that are actually tied into sensation, the peripheral nervous system, central nervous system, and such. So let's get started. Sensation is a process by which receptors in our sensory organs, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, skin, and other tissues, and the nervous system receive and detect stimuli. Perception is the process through which information about stimuli is organized, interpreted, and transformed into meaningful uh, information. So sensation, you know, through your senses, you might feel something that's hot, and it is perceived as something that is dangerous that you won't do again. So you say, ouch, and then you, well, don't do it again. Sensation and perception, uh, what this looks like. Sensory input is uh, comes in through your environment and goes through your senses. Uh, it's translated in electrical and chemical signals of neurons through something called transduction, which sends neural signals processed by the central nervous system resulting in sensation, which is then assigned some type of meaning through perception. And let's talk more about how that happens. Sensation and perception is broken down into two different uh, types of processing. Sensation is um, affiliated with database processing. So uh, it describes how the brain takes basic sensory information and processes, uh, excuse me, processes the incoming stimuli and then uh, there's knowledge-based processing, which is tied in with perception, which generally involves the next step, utilizing past experiences and knowledge to understand sensory information. There's something called the absolute threshold, and this is uh, the part of your, of, your, of your sensory ability to detect some type of, of information that comes in. For example, um, touch. The lightest touch that you can detect can be a bee's wing falling on your cheek. Don't ask me why that bee's wing decided to fall on your cheek, but if that did happen, you would be able to feel it, even though a bee's wing is very light. Um, hearing. The absolute threshold for hearing, an example of that is the ticking of a clock at least 20 feet away. For smell, one drop of perfume throughout a six-room apartment. You can smell that. You can detect this. Uh, vision candle flame seen from 30 miles away on a clear dark night and when it comes to taste your taste buds can detect one teaspoon of sugar in two gallons of water now all of this seems to be you know pretty ridiculous I mean who's gonna try that maybe you can try the one teaspoon of sugar in two gallons of water but you know to really try and detect sugar in there well it's not gonna taste like your regular clean uh, two gallons of water which means that any slight taste that you pick up other than water is that absolute threshold. When it comes to vision, um, there's a number of, of waves, uh, electro electromagnetic waves that we experience in everyday life. Um, gamma waves, x-rays, ultraviolet, infrared, uh, microwaves, radio waves, all of these are, are things that we encounter, however, not through our own vision. Uh, for us, light is sight. Eyes do not sense faces, objects, or scenery. They detect light. And visible light is the only part of the spectrum that is detectable by human eyes. So while we would be able to look at an x-ray, we don't have x-ray vision. You know, we're not Superman. Okay, and um, so we're, we're, we're not experiencing ultraviolet type of vision or infrared either. We are somewhere in between that. We're between ultraviolet light and we are between uh, infrared light. What does this mean? Well, the various types of electromagnetic energy can be distinguished by their wavelengths, which is the distance from one wave hump to the next. And um, gamma waves have short wavelengths and are located on the far left of the spectrum. At the opposite extreme or the far right of the spectrum are the long radio waves. The light humans can see falls in the middle of the spectrum and this measures between 400 to 700 nanometers or billionths of a meter 
Wavelengths also play uh, an important role in determining the colors that we see um, that humans as well as animals can detect. So the colors you see result from light reflecting off of objects and reaching your eyes. Hue refers to the color or it's determined by wavelength reflecting off of an object. Um, brightness represents a continuum from bright to dim. It uh, depends on wavelengths as well or amplitude. Then we have saturation. This is determined by uniformity of wavelength. The average person sees some 2.3 million colors. And perceptions of color are a product of what is in the environment and the brain's interpretation. So let's get into parts of the eye. So there's the cornea. The cornea includes the clear outer layer over colored portion of your eye. Uh, it shields the eye from damage by dust, uh, bacteria, and even eye pokes and uh, it focuses incoming light waves. The iris includes muscle uh, responsible for changing the size of the pupil. And the pupil controls the amount of light entering into the eye, which is why if you shine a light into someone's eye, uh, the pupil usually will contract uh, to prevent that light from coming in, or once you remove that light, the pupil normally expands. The lens includes a tough transparent structure that focuses incoming light and it changes shape to adjust images to near and far through accommodation. Uh, by the way, accommodation is a process by which the lens uh, changes shape in order to focus images near and far. The retina, which you can see at the back here of the eye, right there in the back, I don't know if you can see my cursor pointing, but uh, it's in the back. Um, the retina contains something called photoreceptor cells and it's a site where transduction takes place. Alright, so there's something called rods and cones. Uh, you can see why the light sensing neurons in the back of the eye are called rods. Okay, and cones uh, are the green ones that you see in the picture here. Rods are the tan ones. Uh, rods outnumber cones by a factor of 20. And they're found everywhere in the retina except the centri centrally located fovea. Uh, the color sensing cones are mostly in the fovea. And cones provide color vision and they aid in very fine detail. This is why it is we're able to see colors. People with color blindness um, have problems in that particular uh, area of their eye. And we'll see an example of what that would look like if you were testing for, um, for some type of, of color blindness. So, let's talk about what these parts are. We have the bipolar cells, and uh, they are in close proximity to rods and cones. Uh, they convey signals to ganglion cells uh, whose axons bundle together to form what's called the optic nerve. The optic nerve uh, contains bundled axons of ganglion cells, and they hook the retina to the brain. And then we have a blind spot. Everyone has one. Um, it's found where bundles of ganglion cells in the optic nerve uh, exits the retina at the what's called the optic disc. The fovea includes the central part in retina, and it contains no rods. Uh, cones ex excel at sensing details, so it's all for sensing purposes. There's something called the optic chiasm. And this involves a place in the brain where optic nerves from each eye intersect. So there's communication. There's interneurons. These interneurons shuttle data from the optic chiasm to the visual cortex, where all of your, your visual uh, sensory information uh, takes place. Then there are feature detectors. Feature detectors detect specific features of visual experience, such as lines angles and even movement. It may even be um, part of, of your peripheral vision, which is why it is when it is you're focusing on one thing, you're able to see movement off the corner of your eye. When it comes to the uh, trichromatic theory or light mixing, 
Uh, the color of a light is the result of a mixture of wavelengths from the visible spectrum. I'll repeat that because I know this could be really confusing. The color of a light is the result of a mixture of wavelengths from the visible spectrum. When red, blue, and green light waves are combined in equal proportions, they produce white light. Okay, now this may seem counterintuitive, but most of us have learned that mixing different colored paints yield brown, uh, not white. So it, it sounds really counterintuitive. The rules of light mixing differ from those of paints and other pigmented substances. It has nothing to do with like mixing primary colors and <laughs> secondary colors or anything like that. An example of this, if you were to, if I were to ask you to, to try and see if you, uh, see if you have any type of color deficiency or color blindness, um, it would look like this. Okay, so you look at the color plate and you would see if you can make out that number. Now, if you're looking at this and you're unable to make out the number 74 in this color plate, then you might have a red-green color deficiency. And that is the, the most common variation of color blindness. So if you're staring at this screen right now and you do not see number 74, you may in fact be color blind. Um, now I have never met anyone color blind in my life, um, but it turns out that there are some people who struggle with this and do have a red-green deficiency, um, which results from a problem with the red and green cones that are found in their eye. So now you're looking at the, the green and black, green, black, and yellow flag. What it is I'd like for you to do to demonstrate this, uh, what's called the opponent process theory or sensory adaptation when it comes to these color cones in your eyes, um, you want to stare at that white dot in the center of the flag for about 30 seconds. And then I want you to look at a blank sheet of paper and then tell me what you see. So stare at that dot for 30 seconds and then focus your attention by staring on a white blank sheet of paper and see what happens. Okay, so 30 seconds should have passed. Hopefully you pause the video and if you hadn't, pause it now and start over and stare at it again and then do it. So. 30 seconds have passed and you're now playing my uh, video here again. What you should have seen is an after image of opposing colors. So rather than see the green, black, yellow, you know, s sort of what it is you're seeing right now, um, you should have seen red, blue, and white. So this after image demonstrates what's called again the opponent process theory and sensory adaptation. And staring at one color makes your visual receptors less sensitive to that color and uh, you see the opposing color in the color pair, hence the red, blue, and white. It's a cool experiment. Okay, so I just described that what it is we were just talking about. Okay, so now we're on hearing. Audition is called the sense of hearing. What do we sense and perceive in the energy of a sound wave? Okay, so when it comes to sound waves, um, alternati <coughs> excuse me, alternating zones of high and low pressure moving through the environment are called sound waves. There's loudness, there's pitch, and then there's timber. The loudness is the amplitude or the height of a wave sound that it generates. Pitch is the degree to which a sound is high or low determining um, the frequency of its sound and then timbre is the uh, texture of a sound described by its unique combination of frequencies. Okay, why do we care about this? I'm going to see if I can, um, what it is I'll do is actually go ahead and, and explain the different parts of the ear because to understand this we would really have to know what parts are for what and um, really why does sound waves even matter? Well it does matter for hearing as well as um, the inner ear is, is really important, so I'll move on. Loudness is measured in decibels, and I'll get back to the parts of the ear pretty soon after this slide. Um, loudness is measured in decibels, or lowercase d, uppercase b. The absolute threshold for a human uh, hearing is the softest sound a human can hear, which is described as zero decibels. Okay, so 
the threshold below a whisper that you can hear. Loud noises such as uh, 140 decibels produced by a jet engine and trust you me if you guys were in the Melbourne area this weekend all you heard was jet engines because we had all of those fighter jets uh, this weekend. Uh, it can cause immediate nerve damage leading to hearing loss so if you're exposed to that all the time chances are you have to wear protective gear over your ears because it can cause hearing loss. Chronic exposure to moderate uh, moderately loud noises such as traffic or an mp3 player near maximum volume can also cause damage so it's, a, it's very important to protect it, your hearing um, because you know now you know this so now we're on parts of the ear there's the eardrum this is a membrane which separates the outer from the inner ear there's the hammer anvil and stirrup these make up the bones in the middle ear there's the oval window. It's the membrane leading to the inner ear. There's the cochlea, that thing that looks like a little um, to the right of your screen that looks look kind of like a like a snail. That's the cochlea, and it's primary. Uh, it's a primary component of the inner ear, and it contains the auditory receptors. This goes directly to your your um, the temporal lobe, where it, where it is you house your um, basically your your auditory sense uh, area what I'm trying to say is where it is you process your auditory information and the basal membrane um, this is your hair receptor cells for sound waves this is where why sound waves are important um, and hair receptor cells are so important to transmit those sound waves directly through your auditory nerve to your brain alright people who it is have issues um, with their inner ear or some type of damage to parts of their inner ear will likely need some type of cochlear implant and I've seen a number of people with it from children all the way up to adulthood. Uh, this x-ray on the top of your screen, top right, uh, shows the cochlear implants electrode uh, array coiling into the cochlea so that uh, s kind of a snail looking thing that we saw directly reaching nerve fibers leading to the auditory nerve so it helps people to hear and it really just um, it has an external microphone that that gathers sound as it says on my slide which is organized by a speech processor so things that can cause hearing loss hearing loss is very common as a matter of fact when it is I was in the military um, my I trained in Fort Sill Oklahoma and uh, it was I was the second group of females to come through there we used to be an all-male unit but it's an artillery unit and we got to see things blow up quite often it was really cool but a lot of the uh, a lot of the guys that were there a lot of the males that were on that facility um, complained that they felt like they were going deaf um, why because well they were expo exposed to quite a bit of explosions you know during their military career so this is why uh, they really have to get their ears checked quite often make sure that they're wearing their earplugs and um, you know not experiencing hearing loss if you have damage to hair cells or your auditory nerve that can lead to something called sensory neural deafness and then there's damage to eardrum or middle ear bones uh, these can cause conduction hearing impairment and sound does not need to be ear splitting to do damage which means that you don't have to be traveling in your um, you know really fast car blasting your music for you to just have um, damage it can be at lower decibels and still cause ear damage because of your chronic exposure to it so it, as it says here next time you use your earbuds remember long-term exposure to loud music can cause hearing damage now we have crossed over to smell taste and touch the chemical and skin senses um, the chemical sense involves sensing odor molecules and currents of air and the olfactory epithelium is the site of receptor neurons for odor molecules uh, for someone who is blind as in the example here with Zoe uh, this is a young uh, girl who is blind um, she can sense her mother's scent from 15 feet away well how does she do this well her chemical sense of smell or her olfactory uh, uh, system is a lot more heightened because she doesn't have her sense of sight so f what it is you don't use um, in one area you can make up for in other areas so there's the 
<laughs> smell, or as it says here, nosing around, right? Uh, odor molecules ride currents of air into the nostrils. The olfactory septal neurons in the nasal cavity are stimulated. Um, the olfactory septal neurons fires, causing an action potential. Remember, we talked about action potentials, whether they're at rest or there's some type of of action taking place that your um, your neural there's neural activity that has it firing telling your brain something so in this case smell this and how that how does it smell does it smell really good or really bad um, then there's the glomeruli uh, then communicates the signal to the higher brain center sense uh, excuse me centers of your brain uh, that tells you what it is you're smelling this is called olfaction it's the sense of smell so now we're on taste Gustation refers to the ability to detect uh, the five basic tastes, which is sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and something called umami. When it comes to tasting, taste buds located in the papillae are made up of receptor cells that communicate signals to the brain when stimulated by chemicals from food and other substances. We saw that video at last class with Clive Waring, who it is was unable to recall um, different flavors because he had lost his memory. So with him not having his memory, he wasn't even uh, able to communicate those signals from those receptor cells in his mouth to his brain because there was no memory of what taste belonged to what. So memory has a big, um, it plays a pretty big role as well, not just in taste, but also for survival. Which brings us to evolution and taste. So there's evolutionary advantages. Taste is essential to species survival, um, gravitating towards sweet, calorie-rich foods for life-sustaining energy. Um, this was an adaptive trait during primitive times. Salty foods provide valuable minerals. We associate umami which, uh, with protein. So these are your, your meats that you're looking at right here, anything, nuts, stuff like that. And then uh, bitter and sour warns us that those are foods that you want to avoid. So, you know, back in the day, like way back primitive times, right? Caveman days. Uh, anything that was bitter or sour was not really edible because it sort of like was like a signal that it may in fact uh, could have been poison. Are we all super tasters? We have 5,000 to 10,000 taste buds that are embedded in the papillae. That's a lot of taste buds. Each taste bud contains 50 to 100 taste receptor cells, and um, which are constantly being replenished. So the lifespan for your taste buds are uh, 10 days. So every 10 days we're replenishing them and um, we're, we're getting new receptor cells in, in our taste buds. Which is a good thing, because if we still had the exact same amount of taste buds that we had from, you know, birth, then we probably won't be tasting too well by the time we're 40. By age 20, you've lost half of the taste receptors you had at birth. Again, a very good thing that we're replenishing it, and I can still taste my food. Now this brings us to touch. Uh, touch is really simple. Of course, this is relative to the peripheral nervous system. Um, remember your fingers and your toes from our brain and behavior um, discussion. The sensation of touch begins with our skin, which houses a variety of receptors, including those shown above. So there's the thermoreceptors. These senses hot or cold. The Meissner's corp excuse me, corpuscles. I always get tongue-tied there. Senses touch. Hair follicle receptors, flutter and pressure, and persinian. Uh, corpuscles detect vibrations. So if there's pain, um, pain receptors are primarily housed in the skin. So these are called nociceptors. And if you were to, let's say, step on, uh, gosh, that looks painful. If you stepped on a nail, immediately you would feel pain. And uh, fast pain pathways um, would run straight through your peripheral system directly to your brain telling you, ow, uh, nail, hope, hope it wasn't rusty. And then uh, slow pain pathways, pain information often with emotion. Um, this is, for example, when it is you go to the doctor, the nail is no longer in your foot, but you're crying like a baby because you're still in pain over that 
toe that you just you know ran a nail through um, that fast pain pathway is no longer there there's no immediate uh, reaction or reflex but you still have that pain that's associated again with the emotions of stepping on that nail so there's something called the gateway control theory uh, it's the perception of pain uh, that is increased or decreased by how brain interprets pain through interaction of biopsychosocial uh, factors now when it comes to the biopsychosocial perspective there's a complex interaction between neurological pathways and psychological and social factors and what's called a, a, a gateway or a gate that's involved in the shuttling of information back and forth between the brain and the rest of the body so um, depending on the situation psychological factors and social influences okay can cause that gate to open so this will increase the experience of pain for some or it can close and decrease the experience of pain for others um, for example some people are able to lay down on a bed of nails I don't know why they'd want to but they've done it um, they may not experience pain from that um, there's been other crazy people <laughs> and I say crazy people um, that have had trucks run over their stomachs I don't know why again they'd want to do that but um, the the threshold for pain uh, seems to, to uh, be there because uh, there's this decrease or of, ex of the experience of pain in that regard while for someone like me I'll be a you know crying baby so there's this gate that gate control theory again there's a perception of pain um, that either increases how it is we experience pain or decreases it and that has a lot to do again with psychological factors or social influences so when it comes to pain the psychology of pain negative feelings can amplify pain so what you think about you bring about so there's that cognitive uh, theory somewhat uh, with the psychology of pain laughter and distractions can sometimes soften it so for your child who's going to get an injection if you can distract them maybe they won't feel that pain or the impact as to when it is that needle goes into their arm there's phantom limb pain um, if you look up on YouTube Dr. Ramachandran he, he is the pioneer in this particular area with neuroscience and phantom limb and he created a mirror box for people who it is experienced this phantom limb pain and they would put their hand um, their, their actual hand um, in front of a mirror and clench their fist which would kind of help to serve as releasing the uh, the pain that they had in their phantom limb that wasn't there it's really interesting again Dr. Ramachandran he's very interesting um, causes and theories um, there's changes in the structure of neurons that's a theory when it comes to pain and how it is we experience it and then there's the reorganization of brain in relation to sensations felt in different parts of the body alright so now we're on the fun stuff you got part the past the the hard stuff with the eye and the ears and all this other <laughs> other things that that just looks scary and makes sensation and perception difficult but now we're on perception um, again sensation is database processing perception is knowledge based uh, when your friend texts your smiley face your brain sees two dots a hyphen and a parentheses we already know what this is because of prior knowledge this is through knowledge based processing you are able to draw on past experience and then make sense of the new information you encounter so this is really just a colon a hyphen and a parentheses that is what it is but we're able to look at it and get an emotion from it oh happy smiley face wow you know we, we're able to to get these things laugh out loud and it's because of how it is we perceive it through knowledge based processing here's a something fun that you can try uh, hold your two index fingers about five inches in front of your eyes and this is just a way to demonstrate retinal disparity or what's called the finger sausage illusion I like how they call it the finger sausage illusion this is great for kids to try as well uh, if you hold your fingers like that five inches from in front of your eyes kind of like in the picture here um, you'll see that illusion where it looks like you have two fingertips kind of just merging into one when you move your fingers out farther and the retinal disparity uh, and the retinal disparity and the finger sausage will shrink so you'll notice uh, the uh, more that you move your fingers uh, further apart 
um, it sort of just uh, disappears. There's something called the perceptual set, and this is the tendency to perceive stimuli in a specific manner based on past experiences and expectations. If you look at that green box, what do you see? Okay, so immediately you looked at it and your eyes may have picked up A, B, or A and C to the side of it, so you're looking at it and you're thinking, oh, that's B. But now if you were to focus your attention on the middle column, 12 and then 14, you would probably look at it more differently and say, wait, that's not B, it's 13. It really is how it is you look at it. Um, that depends on whether you view the symbol as belonging to a row of letters or a column of numbers. It really just depends on, on how it is your brain picks it up. Now here's a fun one for you, and this brings us to the end of my slide. Um, when you look at this picture, do you see the young lady turning away? Do you see the young lady? And you can pause it here if it takes you a long time. Okay, if you saw the young lady, now look at it. Do you see the old woman? Hopefully I made you laugh there. <laughs> If you hadn't seen the young woman or the young lady, um, I want you to pause it and really look at it. Look for the young woman, and if you realize, her chin is really the old lady's nose. And the old lady's chin is really the young woman's neck, or her chest. Alright, I hope you had fun with these last couple slides. I know this is really difficult, which is why it is I wanted to bring it to you in one uh, chunk for you to be able to sort of digest it. Um, but with not too much information and um, we'll be moving on to other slides as well and um, I hope that you enjoyed uh, sensation and perception.